well, firstly, access to care. Um, access to care and to, um, and to the needed medicines. Um, what we really need are, is, is increased funding, but also an, an efficient use of, um, of current funding. Um, another issue related to access is not just um, the ability to get to the services you need to have those services in place, but um, a lot of the stigma and discrimination that's often linked to um, the infectious diseases where I, I carry out research. So we're well aware that um, in the field of HIV and AIDS, stigma and discrimination has been a huge barrier to access to services. We also have an issue of um, individuals who are simply unaware of their status. So most people who live with HIV um, in low resource set settings, and here I'm thinking particularly of Sub-Saharan Africa, do not know they have HIV. So we're facing um, um, a major problem in settings where more than 50% of the population living with HIV don't know they have it. If we then take a look at hepatitis, the numbers um, increase massively um, with such a high prevalence globally of hepatitis B and C with hundreds of millions of people living with hepatitis B and C um, and a majority of them unaware of their status. We have a major problem around healthcare delivery um, because they will present, just like in the case with HIV, late. And when they present late because they've been diagnosed late, um, treatment can be less effective, can be more costly, or it can be um, simply too late to stop some of the progression of um, the particular infections. Another major challenge is, um, is having well-trained healthcare professionals. Um, so having um, not just the trained healthcare professionals, and here I'm talking about a real range, not just doctors and nurses, but also midwives and community health, health workers, but also strategies to retain the healthcare workers. If you look at countries like the one we're in, United Kingdom, um, Australia, United States, you'll find that perhaps a quarter or a third of the doctors employed in the health systems in those countries have come from other countries, mainly often from developing countries. So there is a sense still that there is a, a deficit in terms of the trade-off here that developed countries are able to rely on supply streams from the developing world, which has meant that it's unlikely some of them would ever reach self-sufficiency unless there is a deliberate policy decision to change. So that's number one, the kind of high-level policy message. But if you look at the, the practical issues around um, recruitment of health professionals from other countries and ensuring that process enables them to function effectively in the destination country, both as an effective health professional but also as a, a well-rounded member of society, uh, we do need to be looking at the processes of uh, matching and, and recruitment of individuals coming into developed countries to ensure that they're given um, clear indications and accurate information about what their roles and jobs will be like, that where there is a need for skills gaps to be closed, the, the right sort of adaptation courses are provided, uh, and also a recognition that um, in a, particularly in urban areas in North America, the UK and so on, it's a multicultural society which is requiring healthcare being delivered of it. So that in a sense argues uh, somewhat in favour of ensuring that you have a health workforce that represents or reflects that broad-based multicultural multinational society. Any country that's involved in active international recruitment needs to recognise that the process of problem solving by international recruitment does not stop the day the plane arrives with the health professionals. That's actually the end of phase one, but phase two is about supporting them uh, to have the same opportunities, the same rights, and make the same contribution as domestically trained health workers. The more obvious uh, ethical issues around brain drain, uh, impact on the health systems of countries which are losing scarce, highly skilled workers. And uh, that is not something that the source country can solve in isolation. And that's why 
For example, WHO has been instrumental in developing the Global Code of Practice on in International Recruitment of Health Personnel, which is an attempt to try and level up the playing field and um, whilst recognising the right of the individual to move between countries, is trying to ensure that at aggregate level those movements do not detrimentally affect source countries um, and try and modify or manage down the negative impacts of mobility, support and enable the positive potential of mobility. No country can plan its workforce without taking account of cross-border mobility because no country is hermetically sealed. We need to recognise that the dynamics around mobility are such that we will see more of it and more of it happening more frequently. Uh, and that's a challenge for health systems at national level. It's a challenge for employers. Uh, it's a challenge for regulators. Particularly when we're looking at post-2015 uh, universal health coverage as being the, the watchword uh, no country is going to achieve that without an effective health workforce. Biggest one is we don't do much of it. <laughs> so um, our, our systems of health care um, are still very much based on what people know from their training, what they think is appropriate from the influences that they see around them in the environment. They're particularly influenced, usually, by their peers and their colleagues and the people who are influential in their, their work setting. And, um, and so as a result, if all of those things align and all of those have evidence behind them, then people will practice in an evidence-based way. However, for the most part, that's not the case. Usually, at least one of those is not aligned with evidence. It's, it's often aligned with either older theories or with people's beliefs and attitudes and much less with understanding what has been tested and has some empirical basis for it. So, so really, I think the biggest issue is we don't have very much evidence going on in the practice of healthcare. The other thing I would say is I think it's difficult to practice in an evidence-based way because the evidence is fragmented. It's not presented in a holistic way. It's typically not emphasized during training for most practitioners, although I think that is changing quite rapidly now. Um, and I think people find themselves in work settings where they have little time and energy to be able to look for new evidence and new information so that they are really kind of required to find things more quickly and perhaps without the search capability that they need. So what feedback interventions are, it's pretty simple actually. It's, it's taking information about the performance of your work. Um, so let's say, for example, a nurse who's providing care to patients in a hospital setting, in patients. Um, and for example, let's take pain, which is a common issue in hospitalized patients. And the question is, does, does the nurse taking care of the patient know how many of the patients he or she is taking care of experience pain on a regular basis? And the answer to that is no. They may know for each individual patient anytime they ask them, what's your level of pain? They may know patients who are continuously asking them for relief from pain, but on the general basis, unless patients proactively request help with pain management, nurses will not know whether they need it or not. So that's, that's a serious issue. The question then becomes, is there information that in the system that you could provide to nurses to allow them to assess their management of pain? And um, the answer is quite variable. When you have electronic health records and when pain is monitored routinely in a reliable and systematic way, then, then the opportunity is there to do a feedback intervention. If we begin to think through what are the necessary preconditions to mounting a feedback intervention to begin with, which I would argue include existing data and um, an environment with the capability of actually delivering the feedback on a consistent and regular basis over time and not just once, um, and think through the, the understanding of what's going to be effective. So rather than giving people 138 pages of feedback, every quarter, <laughs> thinking about what's relevant, timely, and meaningful for them, and actionable, 
I think if we begin to incorporate those principles, which have been described quite well in the literature as essential, um, and begin to design them into feedback interventions, we will begin to get much more reliable and much more effective feedback interventions in the future. Recommendations and decisions made at a population level often need other consideration than just clinical evidence. So evidence-based medicine might be an excellent way to get our sense of the clinical evidence. However, from a policy perspective, there are other areas that we need information from. For starters, we need economic evidence. We need to know, is this a good way to use the money? And we also need to know, do we actually have the budget to afford this thing? Sec uh, thirdly, besides the clinical evidence and the economic evidence, we need to hear the patient perspective. Is this something they value? How important is this to them? Last but not least, we need to hear about system feasibility. It's possible there's good clinical evidence. It's possible there's good economic evidence. It's possible patients want this. And yet, if the system isn't ready to embrace this change, then it'll be very difficult for us to actually see this policy implemented, even if the three other sources of evidence align. When you think about economic evaluation, it's designed to solve the problem of population health. How can I get the most health for a large group of people? When you think about you going to visit your physician, you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about one individual. The reason this really matters when you're doing the math is that from a population perspective, if you've got some sort of treatment or intervention and there's a 50% chance you'll get zero years of life, that is, it's going to kill you like that, and there's a 50% chance you'll get 10 years of life, then as a patient, you're either going to live zero years or 10 years. But from a population perspective, we can say we will expect the patient to live five years. Not a single patient lives five years. Half die immediately and half get 10 years. So when you take something like cost-effectiveness analysis, and perhaps evidence-based medicine looking at a large group of patients, and then you make public policy based upon this for a population, it can be very challenging then to bring it back down to the patient level, because at the patient level, they're either going to live zero years or 10 years, but the policy decision has been made based on an expectation that we'll get, on average, about five years. This makes it very challenging, and especially challenging for physicians who have to both be on policy committees where they're looking at the population, as well as treat people right in front of them. This is a major challenge where our tools are not necessarily able to handle both perspectives.